This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On February the 5th, the RCMI hosted our annual Member and Daughter Night for 2019. Our speaker and guest of honour was Lieutenant Colonel Julie Callicott, a veteran of three tours in Afghanistan and currently the Deputy Chief of Intelligence for Canadian Joint Operations Command in Ottawa. Your guest speaker is not only a proud officer of the Canadian Forces, but also an extremely well-educated, highly motivated, and proven leader. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Julie Callicott, your guest speaker. Good evening. Thank you so much for the introduction. That was uh, excellent. Can everyone hear me in the back? Yes. yes? Okay. If, if I trail off too quiet, please let me know. It's such an honor to, and a pleasure to be here with you tonight during this evening. It, it's a privilege to be asked and I thank you very much for that. All military service is extremely rewarding and mine, I, I have been very blessed with multiple challenging opportunities for growth. As you just heard, I've experienced three operational tours in Afghanistan, and during my command of two Air Expeditionary Squadron, uh, I deployed twice with my team, uh, commanding Airfield Activation Search Teams, or AFAS, uh, last year in Romania, and most recently uh, this summer in Mali. During these experiences, I've worked with extraordinary people and many heroes. As you know, I have two sons, we just heard that, um, my sisters, on the other hand, have, have girls, so I have five nieces in total. When my husband and I deployed to Afghanistan in 2006, and again in 2009, my boys uh, relocated to their aunts and uncles for those tours. My husband and I deployed together. Different locations in Afghanistan, but we were gone at the same time. So we had to leave the boys with someone. My sisters are adamant after that that there are differences between raising boys and girls. Personally, I, I didn't see the difference. So in preparing for tonight, I, um, I reached out to the boys and I said, do you have any advice on what I should speak about tonight? My requests were answered with echoes of silence. When I asked my nieces for their advice, their responses could fill novels. So perhaps there is a bit of a difference, certainly in my family anyways. So I sat back and reflected and I asked myself, I said, what advice would I have wanted to know if I were to start this journey all over again? So I look back through my, my training challenges, my deployments, and my leadership endeavors. I've learned many lessons along the way, many lessons which have taught me resilience. I had always intended to join the Canadian Armed Forces. As you heard, my father was in, my uncle was, was in the Air Force, my great uncle, my grandfathers, many cousins. There's something in the blood and it's definitely a calling. It was always what I was going to do. My husband's in, my, both my sons are in. When I departed for basic training, my father said to me, um, work hard and be professional. It seems simple. To me, this is, this is the essence of it. Be a warrior. That's what I thought. 
I was a warrior with all the expectations that came with that. But what does that mean, be the warrior? There are many definitions out there, and in the end, we must find what, what that code is and what rings true to us. To me, it means choosing to fight, never give up. Having integrity, being positive, having courage, strength, honor, and respect. I believe that these principles apply to any walk of life and any endeavor. Inherently owning that code as your inner warrior, as my inner warrior, is the basis for six lessons that have helped me, and I'd like to share that with you tonight. They've guided me through the toughest of times. So number one, choose to fight. Every soldier wonders, what's their limits? What's their ability? Most specifically, how will they perform under pressure? Every soldier wonders this. As you heard, I, I joined the Armour Corps in 19, 1990. I was one of the first uh, females in the Armour Corps. Um, eventually, I found myself on sergeant's course, sergeant, sergeant's course in Gagetown. We were fortunate enough to be visited by uh, Brigadier General Radley Wal Walters. He's a legend in the Armour Corps from World War II. And um, one of my course mates asked him, what was it like on D-Day, under fire? How did you react? How did you handle that moment? How did you push through that stress? Of course, I was shocked. Everyone else went silent, thinking, how could you ask that question? How could you be so direct? Uh, of course, we listened intently because, as I said, every soldier wants to know, how do we do that? How do we respond under stress? He answered matter-of-factly. He didn't hesitate. He said, drill, son. Know your drills and take action. I have smiled many times at this advice, and that rang true to me so much in 2009 for me. But it's simple, really. Everyone can use that advice. You prepare. You practice. And when that moment of action demands that of you, you put one foot in front of the other, and you push. You act. Know your drills. It's applicable in all facets of life to everyone. So number two, second lesson, have integrity. The definition I've heard of most for this is integrity is knowing what is right when no one is looking. But, but the one thing I'd like you to take away tonight, and I think it's, it's really important for us females, is be true to yourself. To, don't compromise your beliefs or what's most important to you. Don't compromise yourself under pressure and don't do something that will bring you shame. It's not that you need to be right, you could be wrong. It's that your rights need to be respected and you need to be true to yourself for that. You need to answer to yourself for your own, intri own integrity in the end. You look yourself in the mirror. So integrity. Number three, be positive. This one's helped me, I think, the most in leadership and during the toughest of times. One of my favorite quotes, and I find it the most powerful, do not speak badly of yourself, for the warrior within hears you and is lessened by them. That's David Gremmel, an author. So on basic training, we quickly learn how to ignore the screaming master corporal or sergeant in our face. The ultimate goal of this type of training, of course, is self-motivation and self-discipline. On deployments, we, we lose, on deployments when we lose friends or the injuries are high or mission demands are, are intense, morale can go down very quickly. We're harder on ourselves. We, we, we negative self-talk sometimes. It can happen subconsciously. So in those situations, we need to be positive intentionally. We need to be encouraging to our inner warrior because it's, it's, it's only you that can turn that around. Applying this in everyday life, it just makes everything that much better. Negativity can be contagious. It can bring a team down, but it's likewise it is, it is the same for positivity. Positivity can destroy negativity 
and make that atmosphere so much more enjoyable, can boost morale and make that team so much more productive. Force it. I've applied this lesson during several deployments, and the result on my morale is amazing. Gratitude is also a powerful thing. It complements this positivity. It can pull you out of a deep darkness. I found this little trick is very effective, which is stating 10 things I'm grateful for. Of course, I usually start with I'm grateful for my dog, and by the end of the 10 things, I'm certainly laughing. Number four is have courage. Winston Churchill's quote, fear is a reaction, courage is a decision. It sounds like a simple quote, but it's very helpful. It's likely that at some point in your life, you'll face fear. It can range, of course, from fear of public speaking to actually fear on the battlefield that paralyzes you. This advice, whether it's from Winston Churchill like I spoke of, or the advice from General Rad when he visited, it's the same. Make a decision, take action, and push through that fear. We need both courage in action and moral courage in life as a warrior. In all walks of life, we'll be faced with the requirement for moral courage. Having moral courage can be emotionally charged, of course, and remember to raise your argument, not your voice. Number five, this last one, have strength. Have physical and spiritual strength. It never gets easier, but you certainly get stronger. The simple example for that is push-ups. Start with one, eventually it's five, eventually it's 25. It certainly doesn't get easier, and along the way it's painful, but you definitely get stronger. Embrace the challenge of pain, embrace challenge and pain, because on the other side of every horrible situation is strength and resilience. Physical fitness goals can help, you motiv can help motivate you during these very difficult times in life. They're a distraction, but they, always, they also help strengthen your spirit. Spiritual strength is needed to get through the toughest of times. You're never alone in this world, although at times being surrounded by people can be the loneliest place on earth. But it's us who must force the warrior within to embrace that positivity that's around us and build your spiritual strength. From noticing that smile or giving the smile back when you're doing something as simple as getting your morning coffee or saying something nice when you're walking into work when you really don't feel like doing that, this helps you build that spiritual strength. There's no need to be perfect, but you can let others be inspired by how you deal with challenge. This builds your strength. And number six, the last lesson that's helped me along the way build my warrior is give and have honor and respect. You can't force someone to respect you, but you can refuse to be disrespected. There are many ways to handle difficult situations, and there are many difficult people in this world. To a certain extent, we are treated how we let people treat us. This is also true in the military, but respect and honor are the core of the warrior. It is speaking up and refusing to be disrespected in the appropriate manner that's the key. Likewise, it's important to protect those who can't protect themselves. I was in a situation years ago where a colleague of mine was being spoken ill of. I thought the most appropriate way to deal with that was to tell him, even though I knew it would hurt his feelings. His reaction shocked me and changed the way I approached life. Best advice I ever had. He said to me, why did you let that happen? Why did you let them speak of me that way? Fascinating reaction, and I'll never let it happen again. Protect those who can't protect themselves. In closing, this is my warrior code. Choosing to fight, having integrity, being positive, having courage, strength, honor, and respect. They all go hand in hand. Knowing yourself, understanding the core of what motivates you, to help you not just dream dreams, but hunt goals. I hope these simple lessons, which have given me strength and helped me build resilience through challenge, will be useful to you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight and meeting all of you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Who would like to pose the first question? Yes, go ahead. 
state of the Canadian uh, Air Force, or Canadian Force right now, there's problems with uh, a number of pilots. Shortage of pilots, shortage of aircraft, and you're, I don't know how blunt you can be, but uh, what's the state of our uh, Royal Canadian Air Force at this moment? That's a difficult one. So that's a tough one to talk about, um, for me specifically, because I'm not uh, not up on the actual equipment and that kind of thing. But what I'll, I'll talk a little bit about is, is I know that we are losing, we, we have over the past year, let's say, seen an exodus, if you will, of... Um, key skilled folks, whether that be uh, pilots or crew. And it is definitely a priority of the chain of command to focus on recruiting, retention, and um, the diversity piece of that. So recruiting from the broad spectrum of things. I guess that's what I would say. Uh, in addition to looking at like improving equipment and that type of thing. The why folks are leaving, um, I'm sure they're doing studies on that right now so that they can address the, the, those that were leaving, that are leaving right now, but I'm not current on why that is. Yeah. What would you say? What would you say to a woman who has trepidations in joining the armed forces because they are a woman? How would you encourage them to do so uh, in spite of you know, their fears? Uh, okay, I would say, I would say, I personally have had a fantastic career. Um, I've enjoyed everything that I've done. I have absolutely no regrets. I've been able to manage family um, and achieve everything that I've wanted to achieve, whether that be education or, um, you know, seeing the world, challenging myself. If you have any trepidations, um, I'm certainly willing to talk to you about what those may be and I could probably put those at ease. I've had a fantastic career, and I'm certainly not leaving anytime soon. I'm still having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Can yes, go ahead. Tell us a little bit about the Canadian um, mission in Mali. Um, sure. So my role with my team as the, the AFAST Airfield Activation Surge Team was to open up the airfield for follow-on air assets to then come in uh, to carry on with their role. So our role as Canadian Armed Forces in Mali was to do the Aero Medevac mission. So that's what the, uh, the Griffins and the Chinooks were there to do, along with that very specific um, skill set of the Aero Medevac team on top of the Chinooks. So it was very exciting from my perspective to see that fielded and to take that role over from the Germans. Uh, to see that in action on the ground was uh, was super exciting. Uh, I think that we we definitely took that over from the Germans and carried the, carried on the good work that they were doing. Um, Rodo, so I went I went over with my team to open that up, and then Colonel McKenna was the commander that came over for Rodo Zero and and took that on. He just came back uh, last week, saw his team come back, and then they turned turned that over to Colonel Morehand, who's there on the ground now. The Romanians are slated to take that over uh, in six months, and then the Canadians will, will pull out because the Romanians are carrying on with the mission. It was uh, a super fun place to be. It's not a, it's a UN mission, so it's very different from anything that I had done before, which was definitely coalition or NATO focused. So it's definitely a different, uh, different type of environment working with the UN from the perspective of a much broader nation set. So, very exciting. And the, fielding the Aero Medevac capability was also new for Canada and, and very exciting to see. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, go ahead. One last question. 
Um, given uh, the importance of the reserves, can you comment on uh, how important they are uh, to deployments that are currently happening uh, throughout the world with the Canadian Armed Forces? From what I, I can speak to what I've seen, so um, when I when I look back at my deployments to Romania and also to to Mali, um, I was on a rapid deployment cycle. So m my folks had to leave within 48 hours. So we d definitely did have some reservists on our cycle. So it, we were prepared, and it worked out. Uh, follow on. Teams did include reserves as well. Again, we're Air Force, so it was a little bit different, but it did work out. The uh, the folks in Mali for Roto Zero and Roto One also include reservists. Um, so I don't think anything's changed from you know the years of Afghanistan as far as reservist backfill. And from what I'm hearing as well, there's lots of opportunities out there for for reservists uh, and lots coming. So, I think it's exciting times all the way around. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, over here, sir. Can we ask you to stand and jump? Hi. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to ask this, um, <laughs> but I'm curious about your, your profession, intelligence-wise, um, and a uh, bit of homeland security, I guess. Um, we just had the event, in, our potential event in Kingston. Um, I'm curious about multi-jurisdictional um, efforts, the military with, uh, with police forces, law enforcement around the, around the country. And how do you see, how does that work for you? And are you involved in any of that? And um, the information sharing, I guess, is it appropriate? Or, uh, or is there work to be done? I think, I, okay, I can answer this one. So, uh, <laughs> I think that the events of October 2014 uh, were an excellent opportunity for the different organizations in Canada to work together in order to establish the relationships that we have. Not that they weren't already there, just that I think that they um, improved our already existing procedures. Um, and the, what I speak of is the uh, incident in Ottawa. Um, there already were lines in the sand, if you will, about what's the jurisdiction for intelligence in the Department of National Defense and where the RCMP uh, jurisdiction is, where local policing's jurisdiction is, when I speak of what it, when it comes to specifically intelligence. We work together well when it comes to where the intelligence sharing lines are. And um, I think it's only improved since then. Um, does that answer the question? There's no, sort of, there's policy in place. Uh, there's continued policy development. There's uh, continued governance on that policy. And uh, we share back and forth, but within the lines of those jurisdiction. And there's definitely governance on those sharing agreements. Uh, any last questions? Any last questions? No more questions. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Mr. President. Um, I've actually got um, maybe three little questions. Sure. Um, you uh, you started off uh, your career, well, after crewman, as an intelligent operator. Yes. Is that in the Army? Yes. Of the, and the next question is, uh, are there intelligence operators in the reserves? Yes. In the Army, Navy, and the Air Force? Yes. Oh, okay. I learned something. In the Navy? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I have a resident expert. <laughs> 75 in tops right now, and you offer to be okay. in tops. And, and Glenn is, you're in charge of it. I'm the senior advisor for in, for the reserves. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, the other thing I'm interested in is um, you're an intelligence officer in the Air Force, and you're female. Yes. So, how many intelligence officers are there, as an example, in the Air Force, and what's the female-male distribution? Oh, that's a tough question. Is it 50 or are you the exception? Or? 
I, I'm definitely not the exception. There's um, a couple of lieutenant colonels that are female. Um, one in the Army, one other in the Air Force that I can think of. Uh, two other in the Air Force I can think of off, off the top of my head. Um, I, it's not 50 50 uh, by any uh, means, but it's, uh, and I don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but it's, uh, there's a good percentage of females. It's a tough question because uh, it's not something I think of very often, I gotta be honest. Okay. Um, uh, I've got my last question. Okay. Um, it says that you're the Deputy J2 Intelligence at Canadian Joint Operations Command. Yes. So you go there and you work. What do you do in that capacity? What do you actually do? Okay. Um, so there's approximately 100, if you will, give or take, intelligence personnel at the Canadian Joint uh, Operations Command. Um, and the focus there is, is operations. It's the operational headquarters, if you will, for the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, so someone mentioned what's a JIC. I can't remember who that was. Uh, it's a Joint Intelligence Center. The Joint Intelligence Center is um, <coughs> Intelligence center with assets, if you will, that can uh, do analysis, can uh, provide intelligence products to the commander, that can um, provide operational assessments to the commander, that can provide geo-intelligence products, that can um, lead and conduct joint intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance operations. Uh, so there's a whole host of events uh, that are going on. Human intelligence operations, they can provide uh, intelligence uh, advice when it comes to that. And uh, none of this is classified, so <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> I can say this. So that's what the Joint Intelligence Center does. Uh, so underneath uh, my role there is all of those uh, folks that will provide that in uh, a JIC. And also, there's a plan section there uh, that, that is required to support the commander at CJOC. Well, there's a few other odds and sods in that 100 folks. So there's quite a, a big uh, role to do there. Uh, there's a colonel on the, that I answer to. And so I would also fill in for him if there's anything else that needs to be done. And I think at this time, I'd like to call upon the president to show our appreciation. I actually had a lot more questions, but uh, when I talked to Julie early, she said, you ask some of those questions, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> um, you know, when you think of intelligence, it's uh, pretty exciting stuff, and of course, you can't help but think of James Bond and other exciting things, and all those brilliant intelligence people that Mr. Trump won't pay attention to, so um, uh, our, our Canadian leaders do pay attention to our intelligence uh, uh, people, I think. Anyway, Julie, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to come out of a busy life, uh, both professional and civilian, to come here and speak to us on our uh, member daughter slash granddaughter's night. Uh, your, if you like, philosophy of life or conduct, uh, your principles of conduct, I think, are applicable. While they were rooted in your military experience, uh, they're applicable in life experience. And I'm sure people can, can make that transference. So thank you very, very much for coming here. Um, and as is our custom, uh, at the end of, of, a, of a wonderful session like this, um, we present the speaker with a much coveted RCMI medallion, which, which, is, which is right here. Um, very expensive looking, um, uh, certainly to, to, be, to be valued, and I'm told that a hundred years from now you'll be able to get a lot of money for this. Um, this is not just any medallion, Julie's name is on a master list in the office with a number beside it, and it, this is her medallion. So this will be in the archives of RCMI forevermore. So this is not some cheap little thing we're giving her, you know, this is, this is big stuff. So Julie, thank you very, very much. Thank you.
This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.